Now, another type of posture that we sometimes think about more sovereign is a posture for the web. Now, postures for the web are really interesting, and especially these days because it's changing so much. All right, so if you look at the web, you have the same basic stances for most websites and web applications. All right, there's some variations, some combinations, but there tends to be a lot of consistency from one website to another. Now, there are two types of, of websites, however, that you can break things down into. One of them is information-oriented sites. What would be an example of an information-oriented site? Well, you go get information. You could consider Google. Wikipedia is an excellent example. Now, if you look at Wikipedia, right, and you look at postures for the web, what you actually find is that we tend to use them a great deal as sovereign postures, but they also are transient. So once you go to Wikipedia and you finish reading about the, the information that you need, you stay there. Not usually. You may even have other sites that you're going to, to do for the research. So in that case, it's sovereign in that we tend to keep it full screen, and we are really focusing on it, but it's transient in the respect that we don't spend an, an enormous amount of time on them, such as Microsoft Word or Microsoft Office. Now, there are other things that are also transient when it comes to the web, things like bookmarks and cookies. So these are things that retain their state, right, such as transient postures on our computers. Right, and so once we set them, hopefully they stay. Well, unless you're really worried about privacy, but that's a whole other discussion. Now, there are, of course, also transactional websites and web applications. In other words, e-commerce. And just as with our informational websites, they also have a tendency to be a combination of sovereign and transient. But these sites tend to be more complex. One of the most famous ones, of course, is Amazon. Right? It is an e-commerce site, correct? How many of you will actually go to Amazon to also find information? OK, you guys are like, like this. OK, let me, so that you don't feel so bad and you can actually raise your hand. There's some research that says 95% of people actually will go to Amazon to get more information, too. It could be specs. It could be reviews. Um, it could be getting an idea of what the different, um, let's say, the different uh, types of hard drives that are out there, those sorts of things. So it's really a combination. In fact, there are people who will, let's say they're going to buy something on one website, they'll go and research on Amazon.com and they'll go back to the website and buy it. So that's very, very common. So you need to keep this in mind when you are designing these things and you need to think about how is it that you want to present yourself to your user. <clears throat> now, you want to remember that sometimes some of these sites are used for a significant part of an employee's job. In that case, it's more sovereign. Now, you're probably thinking, Amazon? I want, to I want that to be my full-time job. I'll shop. That's actually not what I'm referring to, although supposedly those positions exist. I've never really seen one. A lot of companies use dashboards where you go in, either to your office or work from home. You log into their web application, and you have a dashboard that has all your tasks, has all your emails, that gives you whatever information you need to be able to do your job. That's what we're talking about. Now, why is it transactional? Because even though you may not be buying with money, per se, you are still engaging in different types of transactions. You are still sending and receiving documents, for example. Right, you are focusing your time, really, using that site. So designs such as that, you have to, when you think of transactional websites, you need to also think beyond e-commerce. <clears throat> of course, you know, e-commerce, online banking, and other consumer transaction sites do need this balance. 
because they are transaction, but they can be heavily informational. The thing you want to keep in mind, though, is also what are users' propensities. So early on, there were a lot of e-commerce sites that when they went and they started, they would, of course, have ratings and reviews and all those sorts of things. But one of the things that they were told was you must have discussion boards. So all these new e-commerce sites would put up discussion boards. Right? Because with some of the big sites, they had these huge discussion boards. What do you think happened to the discussion boards on these mom and pop sites? Anyone want to guess? How popular were they? Yeah, not very popular with um, their customers because they'd go to, the, go to the discussion boards that were more popular. But if they didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, if they did not have the uh, proper security settings or security protocols, they were very popular with spammers. So you need to think about how the site is going to be used. How do you balance out the transactional versus informational aspects of things? <clears throat> you need to make sure that navigation is very clear. It's very easy to access any supporting information that's needed. And streamlining of transactions are key. If we focus just on e-commerce sites, for example, you don't want people to just abandon their carts because it is a difficult process to actually purchase something. People will leave and go someplace else. Now there are some other postures, right? There are kiosks. Who knows what a kiosk is? A couple of you. Who wants to give me an example of a kiosk? I'm sorry? Right, so you go to the movie theater and you're going to buy tickets. You don't want to stand in line to talk to a human. Yeah, why would you? Just go to the kiosk. It's faster, it's easier, you don't have to say thank you. Or Redbox. Right, you go, you, you choose the movie that you want, it gives it to you after you pay them. That's another great example of a kiosk. Anyone else? The Kohl's kiosk. I love the Kohl's kiosk. This is terrible. You can tell where I shop. <laughs> right? You can go there. It has this nice big screen. It says, oh, don't have this in the store. Here. Oh, look. I found it for you. Do you want to order it? Free shipping. Free shipping. Right? So you can order what you want. Or you go there on Black Friday. Haven't done that in years. Did that once. You're like, yeah, I see this three-hour long line. Where's the kiosk? Now there's one that I want that I'm waiting for someone to mention because I'll bet it's one that you guys use all the time and you don't think of it as a kiosk. ATMs. I know you guys are so awesome. <laughs> right, an ATM is actually a kiosk. It may not have you know, the pretty little outer packaging of a kiosk. It's stuck in a wall most of the time. But that is also a kiosk. That's the posture of an ATM. Now when you think about a kiosk, you need to remember that a lot of users, they're either first-time users or they don't use it often enough that it's as if they are first-time users. So you need to make sure that it is very easy to use with a lot of affordance. Remember the example that I showed you earlier in the semester that showed a, a, a bank kiosk, a bank ATM, and we talked about some of the verbiage that was used? That's an example of how important it is to think about these things. And it's also an example of how difficult it can be. So you want to make sure that things are clear, that you have you know, nice large buttons, that it's very concise, and that users can get to what they want very quickly because they don't want to spend a whole lot of time there. So usually they have test screens and bezel buttons on the side of the display, and it involves a single transaction. Now, there is an exception to that, and these are educational and inter entertainment kiosks. Have any of you ever seen any of those? Yeah, there's a couple of those. So if you go like to the Museum of Science, they have those. They have, like, they have one that's like a big globe, right? And you go up to the kiosk, and then you can change things on the globe, and it talks to you and all sorts of things. Right, it's a lot of fun. My five-year-old loves it. She doesn't pay attention to what it says, but she loves that she can change things on the globe. You need to be a little older. 
Right, so they actually vary somewhat because you don't have this strict transient posture. You tend to have a posture that does have transient aspects of it, but users tend to spend more time on these educational or entertainment kiosks than they do at, than, say, an ATM. Right, so things like exploration is more important. So these will be a little bit more complex. We're not just looking at the completion of a transaction. It's users actually trying to find information. And it also implies that there is more data density. Your interactions are going to be more complex. Now, they're not going to be as complex in general as a sovereign posture application. But they are more complex than your typical kiosk. Now, there are numerous other types of postures, especially these days. What are some of the other postures that you can think of? Someone just picked one up over there. That's my subtle hint. Except no one saw that. A tablet, a phone, you know, mobile devices. Those are all different postures. And how you are designing something, you really need to consider what posture it is that, that you are dealing with. So designing something for an iPad is even different from designing something for a smartphone. A lot of times what you want to do to have good design in these areas is, one, we don't want to think of these things as just computers. Remember how integrated these things are in our lives these days and how much it's changing. So you, you want to, I know there's something stinky in here, isn't there? <laughs> oh, never mind. Okay, Oops, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, ignore what I said. All right, so you want to do things like integrate your hardware and software design. All right, you want to make sure you keep in mind the context. All right, so if, even if you have a handheld, having a... Oh, my gosh, I didn't realize what time was... So even... Um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up really quick. So you want to remember, is it, you know, are you using a handheld for a game or using a handheld for a uh, bank transaction? So uh, you want to use modes judiciously, balance navigation with, with display density, and customize your platform. Okay, is there anything else? Oh, yeah, handheld devices. We went through that already. And appliances, my favorite. Who have seen the smart, uh, the smart appliances like the, um, well, there's the smart TV. There's the refrigerators that have the, the, uh, in, the, 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 oh, the washing machines. Yeah, you can talk to them. You can talk to your washing machine, yes. It will send you messages on your smartphone. I'm serious. Yes. It will, some of them will actually send you messages and say, oh, this doesn't seem to be working. Call the repairman. So just think about those things. 